I was just going to start right at the panel discussion, but they asked me to cover a few, a few points to begin with. So thank you to everyone that's helping with the meeting and our panelists. Uh, I left, I didn't know you were going to be here, Selena, so I apologize, your name should be up there. When you are treating the dizzy patient, you need to think of the whole system. It could be something as simple as cerumen, perforated eardrum, cholesteatoma, all the way up to the labyrinthine system as it goes into the brainstem. So you want to consider all those things. Uh, the purpose of the panel today is we want to define what dizziness is. We want to see what the description of the spell is symptoms that they're having coexistent with their symptoms of dizziness. And we wanna be able to differentiate after today the difference between peripheral and central disorders. We wanna cover what the examination looks like in the office. We wanna decide what tests should we get not to waste diagnostic tests. And then we wanna discuss the differences between um, central versus peripheral dizziness. So first of all, just trying to clarify what is meant by dizziness is not always easy because people come in and they forget that they're at an ENT office. So they want to talk about their headaches. They want to talk about their menstrual cramps. They want to talk about just everything that's bothering them at that time instead of trying to define what do they mean by the term dizziness. So we try to glean out these different kinds of dizzy symptoms like vertigo. It's an illusion of motion, but it doesn't always mean spinning, does it? It could be a visual tilt that's also dizziness. You can have imbalance. The best description I ever heard of oscillopsia is like looking at a video camera in both eyes and walking, and you see that bouncing with all your steps. The original case description of oscillopsia was in someone that had streptomyosin therapy in Africa, and he said when his heart beat, he would see the, the area jumping with just his heart beats. So that's oscillopsia lightheadedness, you know, we see the, when you're talking about the geriatric population, many of them are gonna have lightheadedness symptoms, you know, a pre-syncopal episode, something like that. You can have visual vertigo, of this, you know, which has nothing to do with the ears, but it's something you have to document. Um, we call that, some of people with visual dizziness have what we call vertical heterophoria. Vertical heterophoria is where like one eye is at a different plane than the other eye, and it can happen as a recovery from a sixth or fourth nerve palsy, or it could just happen on its own and people have to wear prism glasses, but you could be the first person that they see. Multisensory dizziness, those are elderly patients who have lost the feeling of the bottom of their feet, so they have proprioceptive cue abnormalities. They can be wearing trifocals, which we never like, um, and then they have maybe some labyrinthine, so that's multi-sensory. It involves the proprioceptors, the visual, and the vestibular. Physiologic, that's kind of a problem where one ear hasn't adapted to the other ear after an injury. Obviously, we all have psychophysiologic. People come in, and how often do they say they have a head fog? They just can't think straight. And you can have maladaptive imbalance. So. What I try to do is after I get their description, I want to know if the vertigo or imbalance happens for seconds, minutes, hours, or days. Once I do that, I want to know what other things are going on. Do they have acute vertigo, first time? Did it involve hearing, pressure, tinnitus, or did, did it not? Is this a recurrent kind of thing? And it is, does it involve hearing or balance possible? Do they have positional vertigo, disequilibrium, and then any of the other things? And I'll get, after trying to take a history, I tend to categorize it. Do I think this is central or peripheral? And then we can do some examinations in the office that are really important. This is the most important slide I've ever seen. And it's from an article, you know, a book chapter probably 100 years ago. But it talks about the vestibular ocular reflex, which is key for what we're trying to do. And the way it was described to me by, by a friend of mine is that this is all physiologic. So this is the physiologic response of an ear. And your ears, the ampulated ends are my fists. They're about 30 degrees angulated upward. That's why you turn their head down 30 degrees when you're trying to accurately stimulate or maximally stimulate. And as I turn to the right, I'm stimulating the right. So 
turning this way, you have more afferent stimulation, but you also have desimulation, or you have the weakness pattern, still the left ear is being stimulated, but just not as fast as what you're stimulating the right ear. So physiologic nystagmus, if you're turning to the right, your eyes go left, always equal. That's why we use a rotary chair, 40 degrees right, 40 degrees left. If you have a damaged labyrinth, it relatively makes you think that the right ear is being stimulated. So if I damage my left ear, slow pace kind of goes left, quick nystagmus to the right. So we have to remember that as we're doing our examinations. The, I had the honor and pleasure of working with a friend of mine, Joel Goebel, and he talked at the academy, I talked with him at the academy for many years on the 10 minute examination of the dizzy patient. And it literally takes that long. The only trouble is that 10 minutes extends when you're at the end of the day and your dizzy patient says they've been dizzy for years and it's 4.30 in the afternoon. But these are all easy to do examinations. You do your ear examination, you wanna know what the ear looks like, you do a pressure test, do a tuning fork test, check for eye motility. Um, this is what an ENG is. You essentially can do a pretty good ENG or VNG in the office just by watching eye motility. You do calibrate, that's a saccade, pursuit, convergence and divergence, visual fixation with different things, and I'll demonstrate that later. Um, since I don't do nose and throat, when I would do, go and do consults in the hospital, I only carried Frenzel's glasses. That was my doctor bag. Frenzel's glasses and a little forceps to clean out ears. So Frenzel's glasses, everybody should have some in your office or one in your office to evaluate the dizzy patient. We have a Snellen chart to do Snellen eye test. That tells you about recovery or lack of recovery. It's just a regular visual Snellen eye test. And you have the patient look left and right at about one hertz, one, 1,000, two, 1,000, three, 1,000. And with their head not moving, tell them where you can read. What's the lowest line you can read? Now do head motion. And they should be able to read within one or two lines if they have accurate vestibular ocular reflexes. If it's more than two lines, if they drip to the third, there's, visual, there's VOR asymmetry. And that's an easy little card test that we have that in all of our examination rooms. Posture control is basically a Romberg. Eyes closed, pointed Romberg. Bakuda stepping test, you have the patient march with their eyes open, looking forward, and then you have them close. And the right side pushes you to the center. The left side pushes you to the center. If you have a weakness, you expect them to deviate toward the side of the weakness. And, that have, and it's very easy to do. Uh, Cellular test, I don't do heel shim, but I do finger to nose. And I have them try to touch my finger. And then the last thing I do is the hall pike positioning, positional type of examination. And basically, when you think about it, that's what a VNG is. So you don't need any testing initially when you're doing your examination. I do testing later on, but I'm pretty well down the pathway of thinking about what my patient has. And you have to remember that not, if you look at a VNG, just because you have a normal test, that doesn't mean you have a normal patient, does it? What's the most common vestibular disorder? Benign positional vertigo. So by the time the patient gets in to see you, or by the time they get the testing, it may be, have resolved. So they can have a totally normal VNG, but still have an abnormal group of symptoms. And then sometimes you have an abnormal VNG. You have a peripheral vestibular weakness, but really the patient is complaining of a head fog, or they're complaining of headaches. They really never had a dizzy spell in their history. So some patients will present with you and they have abnormal testing, but it doesn't really make sense. It's something that happened many years ago or just asymmetry, their right hand, their right arm is longer than their left arm and just go all, uh, don't worry about it. You need to try to test when patients are symptomatic and that's become easier now that we have cell phones. So we have patients always try to take a video of their eye movements when they're dizzy. 
And then you add different things with your physical examination to come up with a diagnosis. So we had patients like this. What are we looking at? Patient with vertigo, intense vertigo. Well, she happened to have zoster at the same time, so she has a vestibular weakness, right? People come in with the diagnosis of Meniere's disease, and what they have is cerumen impaction. That's why their ear is full. Or they have middle ear fluid in that lower picture, and that's why their ear is full. They have a hearing loss. It has nothing to do with Meniere's disease, but they still come in with these symptoms. I always do a tuning fork test and a pressure fistula test, and you'll find pressure test abnormalities in patients with superior canal dehiscence or with active Meniere's disease or with true fistulas, or with superior canal dehiscence. So there's several illnesses where that pressure tests. So if you don't have a Bruns otoscope kind of setup, get one, they're cheap. And I just look in the ear with a microscope or with a headlight. When you put the Frenzel glasses on, why do we use Frenzels? Anybody? So they can't focus. Pardon? So they can't focus? Right. So after a couple of days of vestibular neuritis, your body goes through a compensatory change in the VR and you have visual fixation, so you can stop when you're just physically examining the patient. So you use the nystagmus, to, you use the frenzels to bring out nystagmus that wasn't there previously. But this person had a viral etiology problem and had spontaneous nystagmus that I could, that was actually an ENT resident. Uh, he had vertigo and was compensated by the time I got to see him. And then the head shake. I do the head shake, the head thrust, um, dynamic visual acuity with the Snellen chart. Those are my compensatory tests that I'll do. So with the head shake, you're basically looking for brainstem asymmetry. And I use the Frenzel's glasses. Some people do not. You can have the patient, you can see nystagmus if you just have the eyes closed. And you'll see the eyeball nystagmus under your upper lid. So that's another way you could do it if you don't have Frenzel's glasses. But you shake at about one hertz, one 1,000, two 1,000, three 1,000, with the head pointed down 30 degrees. And by doing that, you actually have vestibular loading in the nuclei. And then when they open their eyes, you can see if there's a vestibular asymmetry, you see end of vestibular head shake, you'll see nystagmus and it usually will point away from that ear that's involved. So if you have a right vestibular weakness, the eyes will drift, and then you'll see left beating nystagmus with a head shake. So that gives you information. All of this is done pretty quickly, and you can do it. We're gonna go right now to the cases. So this is a 42-year-old white May, female with episodic positional vertigo, constant postural instability. She had a severe attack of vertigo with nausea, vomiting, but no hearing loss a couple of years ago. No history of migraine in the patient, and there's no migraine history with that patient. So let's just go right down the line. We'll go from so Jeff, why don't you start us off? What are you thinking about in a history like this? Um, so a couple questions. So first off, I would ask, my first question would be, I want to hear you, I want details play by play. When you had a severe vertigo attack, what happened? What were you doing? How long did it last for? Do you remember? I was putting my shoes on, and when I was putting my shoes on, I felt like I was tumbling forward. And that feeling lasted for? Seconds. And then you know, it went away? It went completely away, but my head seemed like I was off balance. Okay. And then it happened again. How long after it was in between the attacks? It happened quite a bit for a few days, and it's gone away. Okay. And then my next, I mean, physical exam is normal? Everything's okay? Everything's normal today. Um, Paul Pike's negative in the office? Yes. Hearing test is, is normal? Correct. Um, how bothered by you? How is this a... Does this bring you significant distress I'm in your life? I'm scared to death it's going to happen again. Um, so first, I would reassure her. I would explain. I mean, in my mind, I would think this is probably a benign positional vertigo that has resolved itself. Um, I would make sure that she has our information, and I would tell her if this ever happens again, you pick up that phone, you call, we'll get you in, and we'll, we'll take a peek. And then I'd also give her information of, of a vestibular therapist, and I would say, if you're interested, go get an evaluation with the vestibular therapist. And um, if you want to 
uh, learn more about Epley maneuvers and so forth. Uh, that's where I would start. So Gabby, do you, do you have a physical therapist in your office? We do not. So this patient said, well, I'm scared it's gonna happen again. Well, what do I do when it happens? Um, because you know, in all reality, you say, come call us right away, and then it's three to five days minimum before they really get in to see you. So do you ever show people Brand Daroff exercises or how to do a hall pike or anything like that? Uh, I don't. I, well, I guess one thing is I'm just curious about the constant postural instability, what that, what that means to her. It bothers me. Just, but it's very specifically related to the positional effect for a couple seconds. Those are, okay. Um, I pro so yeah, so to get ahead of it, I might just have her go see just right away, say, why don't we get you in with one of our physical therapists? There's a couple in town who I think are particularly good at positional things. Uh, okay. And say, why don't you go you know, meet with Julie? Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't get better, then let me know. Very good. So I still don't know what the diagnosis is. So what do you think here? Um, you have benign positional, positional nystagmus. Should you have a head impulse that's abnormal? Do we have a completely normal exam? What a, which one of those? You have to pick A, B, C, D, or E. What are you gonna find on this patient? You know, when we go back to the clinical vignette, um, I don't think we've mentioned that this all started with the severe vertigo attack. Um, so I would imagine this is kind of, a, it, she could have had a, like a post-neuretic episode at that time and had BPV kind of falling. Um, so I would, you can imagine that they could have a, a positive head impulse test with instability. So That's say, like the head thrust B. test, right? right? So I would say B, um, I mean, all of these are, are, could have normal exam, could have bit, but like in terms of the vignette that you gave us, I would say B for, for this case. So um, I didn't mention this. Does anybody else use this three inch foam thing in your office, we do. So we just have people take their shoes off and there's a three inch foam and they stand on it. That really is hard to do. And they close their eyes and see how their, their balance is going. But that's another instability test that you can do. So right, I would pick B because this is like a post neuretic benign positional vertigo, which has been documented many times. Um, so, these are kinds of the finding that we had. So Jeff, when you were saying, I'm curious about that instability. Uh, if a patient has a bad bout of benign paroxysmal positional nystagmus, it's not unusual for them to feel like their balance is kind of off. Because when you think about it, we rip something off the utricle and it can be just a few little crystals and it can be the whole basement membrane. And there's plenty of histology that documents that. So my preliminary diagnosis, positional vertigo, post neuritis. So it would be B. So very good. Let's go on to another topic. This was her lab findings, by the way. What lab tests would you order, do you think? I mean, if, Anything? if, if she was getting better and she went to PT and was feeling better, I wouldn't think there's any reason for testing, even though she might have all these findings on testing, yeah. I wouldn't necessarily order testing. Yeah, so that's always a question, isn't it? How many tests do you think you should get on a patient, even though they're getting better? Should you get any tests on those patients? Well, I was gonna say, it depends on her anxieties. Does she have any underlying th thoughts? Sometimes you get patients, well, my father died of a brain tumor. Right. Yeah, and you've got to say, well, you know in your own heart, this is a neuritic type of process. So I have five really good, smart panelists, and I want to ask, because I know what is ordered in our community, how many would get an MRI on this? From the clinical pre pre presentation. From a clinical not. presentation. I wouldn't. You have to remember, it was post-neuritis yeah. and benign positional vertigo. So it's clear peripheral process, and you've got normal hearing, no tinnitus. Correct. Nothing else. So, so the index of suspicion to do an IAM. MRI, it would be extremely low. So, uh, and I think then all of us are kind of agreeing with that, but most people end up getting an MRI for this. And there is stuff in the literature where some, I'm sorry this university ever presented this, but they presented two cases of an acoustic neuroma 
two, two and a half centimeters, who presented with neurit neuritic symptoms, no hearing loss, and then had positional vertigo. Although that's in the literature, I think you can defend it not getting an MRI on any of these because it fits a very common pattern. And the reason you have post neuritis and it's only 70%, you know, Schutnik's original description was 100% weakness, but it could just involve the superior vestibular nerve and the vascular supply to the superior nerve is very, very tenuous. There's spicules of bone. And actually, Joel Goebel actually wrote about that many years ago. Um, so this is what we've already talked about. So how do you treat it? First of all, you diagnose it. And you have to remember that although some of your patients have cupulolithiasis, Many of them have canalithiasis. How do you determine between those two? So it takes an old man to do this. So I'm the oldest guy here, and I can tell you my story, but I'm going to ask Chris how to manage this. How do you decide if someone has cupulolithiasis versus canalithiasis? Had positioning tests. Yeah. And is there any trick that you have? when they have a prolonged <coughs> response, rotatory nystagmus in the dependent ear, to kind of get those crystals free? Because they have symptoms, that's for sure. What do you do with those patients? Well, it's still, if they've got positive torsional nystagmus, it still goes through the Epley maneuver. Mm -hmm. do, do, do that and see if they'll do it. Um, so sometimes those crystals, though, are just stuck. stuck. Yeah. So do you have an oscillator in your office? No. We have those little oscillators in our office. They cost 10 bucks on Amazon. And they just put it on the head and shake the hell out of them. <laughs> yeah. And that makes them feel dizzy, too. They get really dizzy with that. So I don't have any other tricks. Does anyone else have a trick? Yeah. So but next. Yeah, but more likely to send them to physical therapy, because you're not likely to cure them with a couple Epleys in clinic. <laughs> no, you're not. OK, so this is the patient. <coughs> what do you do with this? She's, she's she can't do a hall pike, right? But yeah. she's dizzy as heck. She can't do anything. She got a stiff neck. I mean, what's what's up with the neck? Because she's well, she has positional vertigo and she has cervical arthritis, so she can't say, yeah. she can't lay back. Right. So how do you treat this person? Because there's plenty of elderly people that have this. Send them to physical therapy. <laughs> <laughs> you're right. You're right. I have That's this thing that I do, <laughs> yeah, I and you can do. Assistance. You all know what a Samant maneuver is, right? A Samant maneuver, it's kind of like a Brant Daroff exercise. And what you're trying to do is you turn the head such that the bad ear, this time it's the left ear, and you, you lay them down on their side. And then you bring them up quickly, and you do on the other side. And that's a diagnostic test that I do on patients if I can't get them to do a hall pike, right? So you, and the Brant Daroff exercise is turn one way down, up, other way down, up. And Brant Daroff, or German, and they used to admit all their patients to the hospital, and after 10 days of doing this, 90% of people were better. But sometimes you can't free it, so you can also do a Samant maneuver. It was a French man, Samant, and they would take him from this position and do 180 degrees over. And you're basically, what you're doing is you're trying to thrust those crystals into the other area. Maybe I'm the only, that's the reason we have nine of us in my group, we take care of all dizziness for the state. So we're seeing patients like this every, every day. I'll have these cervical arthritic patients that have trouble. One of the problems is you've got to have a good back. And if you've got a carer yeah. or they live by themselves, how are you going to do this on a daily basis on a trial? Well, our beds go, our examination chairs lay flat. Yeah. And my nurse will come into the room with me and we basically lay them down. And we're both on the back side, and we just kind of flip them over. And I also have a full physical therapy department in my clinic. Yep, so don't, don't you send them home and say, these are the exercises you've got to do? No, I, they can't do it very well. They can do brand tear off exercises, yeah. right? And we also get them to physical therapists. Does anyone know John Lee? He's kind of a really nice person. And what he does for these people, this is an Omniax machine. And this is developed by, and he's just shaking them back and forth, trying to loose those crystals. John Lee's in Florida, really a great guy, but it's tough. 
is this is NASA space flight type of <laughs> well, it's thing. interesting. He's, uh, uh, we have one of these machines. It was John Epley's original machine. There's only nine or so left in existence, but so we're monitoring their eye movements. And you're basically seeing the VOR turn right, and you get compensatory of nystagmus. And then this machine will lay patients down, and we can actually do a hall pike this way. Have you seen those before? John Epley made like 15 machines, five of them are dead now. We have a mechanic that comes in and tries to fix these for us and it's not easy, but it's the greatest thing. It's busy in our clinic. It's busy seven hours a day, five days a week, three week wait list. Because sometimes you have to re and retreat them. So in our office, we do very few posterior canal occlusions because we really can treat them in all their different positions, but sometimes you have to Continue it. Yeah, so this is the next person, 35 year old, two year history of episodic vertigo and imbalance of variable duration, and this lasts hours up to days. She does have tinnitus in both of her ears, but no hearing loss. She does have fullness. She had childhood headaches, and when she has the attacks of vertigo, she says they can be brought on by visual stimulation, or when she's about to have these dizzy attacks, she has a preeminition of something weird going on with her visual acuity. Maybe something like eye focusing problems. So what's our next question? What would you like to do? Do you have any more questions for her? Or what do you expect to find on physical examination? Where do we want to go, Jeff? Going back to. So, so again, same thing. Uh, I, I would want to know family history of migraine. Is this person obese? No. Um, any family history of migraine? Nope. Uh, but so, she did have headaches as a child. Yeah. So, and then normal exam? Well, that's our next slide. Yeah. So I, I would work my would way you, through all this, the vestibular testing. Mm -hmm. um, so you do that 10 minute examination, mm -hmm. and it's pretty much all, all normal. <clears throat> so, so, in my mind, what's jumping off the page here is a, mi a migraine um, picture. So what I would do is I would, uh, as long as every, all, all my ex audios and temps are normal, I would write down a diagnosis of vestibular migraine. I'd probably provide her an educational handout. This is someone I might consider an MRI scan just to make sure I'm not missing any central pathology. And then I would have her get the MRI and if that's normal, and she educates herself about a vestibular migraine diagnosis, I'd bring her back and potentially talk about treatment. So, Gabby, do you have, a, what handout do you give to a patient like this if you assume, and I'm not agreeing yet, that this is MAD, migraine-associated dizziness, what do you give them? Do you have handouts in your office? I do, or? yeah, I have, a, I have a handout. The one thing I would also ask just about head trauma, just make sure there wasn't a history of head trauma. Yeah, okay. Um, but yeah, so I have a handout and I go over with them um, the importance of identifying triggers that very often they'll have triggers that maybe in retrospect, that they, didn't, that they might be able to realize like dehydration, lack mm -hmm. of sleep, stress, certain foods. Okay. Um, so how many on the panel would get an MRI scan? So yeah, I'm, how, how long has she been having these for? She's 42. No, a couple of years. Yes. I, for me, it also would depend on like I normal would say, physical. Yeah, exam. But, but like, how did they get there? Because like, if this is the first time she's ever even heard of this concept, she's never seen anybody else for this. This is the first point of contact. She's tried nothing. She's then tried probably nothing. not get an MRI. Mm -hmm. If it's one of those where she's already seen, you know, a neurologist or primary care or somebody else, and you know, so so then, that's there. that's the key, right? We sometimes always jump to an MRI scan and then you televisit their return appointment and you say, your MRI scan's normal. And she said, I had an attack last night. That's, you haven't done anything. So don't jump to an MRI scan to show a negative result. So I agree, I don't think I would get an MRI for a while because there are patients that you want to do an MRI immediately, right? Because they have central signs that are dangerous. You have disconjugate gaze. You have something weird going on. And there could be an early brainstem stroke taking place. And I've had two patients in my career 
that came to see me the day before they stroked. So you, you have to be willing to judiciously use resources because, you know, by the way, all of you have scorecards now. If I send you a dizzy patient, how expensive is it for you, for the insurance company, when they send a dizzy patient to your clinic? So they're keeping scores, and that may affect your referrals in the future. So you want to be judicious and know why you're getting different tests. Do any of you use this hyperventilation in the office? It's kind of fun. You put Frenzel glasses on, and you have them hyperventilate, and about half the patients will have downbeat nystagmus, and their symptoms are provoked by doing it. So it's kind of a fun taste, but it... So um, I think we've agreed that kind of going to an ENT office, I get an audiogram on almost everybody, because some people say they don't have a hearing loss and you find a slight asymmetry, and you can't be sure you're not dealing with a Meniere's kind of patient. So I think an audiogram is minimal. Uh, and I think a VNG, I like to just know, we do what we call a vestibular VNG, so we're just testing the vestibular system. So we do positional testings and caloric. So I think, I think C would be reasonable. Um, does anyone disagree with that? Yeah. I would maybe push back a little bit. Um, I mean, so my question then, a 35-year-old with headaches and the photophobia, the visual disturbances, I mean, in my mind, how long would you let that go before making sure you're not missing the central pathology, like uh, MS or something? I'm going to have Gabby answer that. I, I know for myself, I've not gotten an MRI for my vestibular <laughs> migraine. Like, I, I don't want right. to know so what's in there. So is so common yeah. with migraines in general that I think you can just rest assured that that's, that's part of migraine. So I, I don't rush to do it. Well, I think the longer term history is... Going back to that again, it's the progression. If this is something that's not getting progressively worse over time, more frequent, um, and if you have some type of uh, follow-up with the conservative things, so same thing was already mentioned, diet, sleep, and stress, I recommend they keep a diary so they, often they can't recognize patterns. I almost always put them on magnesium, vitamin B2, just talk to them a little about preventive stuff. Those are very easy. Do you have that on a handout? Because yep. that gets to be, you guys have to have a... We have a handout in our office, and it talks about the migraine diet, and it talks about vitamin B2 and magnesium in appropriate doses. So that's a reasonable thing to have and to hand out. And it's surprising, just like you're inferring, how many people get better on magnesium and B2. It is amazing, and they adjust their diet. They, I make everybody give up caffeine, and they go through the caffeine withdrawal and all those kinds of things. But it's pretty amazing how many people do get better just with that. Uh, how much do you think is a placebo effect? Pardon? Is there a placebo effect to these? Um, I don't think so, because okay. many people, I'm not usually the first doctor they see, so they've been around right. to multiple people. And um, I, I just, I, and they've tried other things. So I don't know. I think you've got down I, the root of triptans, you know, anti migranous therapies or anything like that. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Using triptans, you know, actually anti migranous therapies if the frequency is frequent enough. Uh -huh. get... Yeah, so um, I think we all have to have a system of how we react to these patients. And I just start with this sheet of paper, and then I televisit the patients back in three weeks. And if they're not getting better, I go on to this. So I'm one of the people that don't rely all the time on physical therapy or the neurologist, because it takes a long time to get in to see the neurologist. So for me, I tend to start treatment. And there's certain, certain areas that you treat. If you're treating migraine, you have to think about beta blockers, and that's pretty easy. But you have to know what the side effects are and what other medicines. So a lot of people like propranolol. And I have patients that just stay on 10 milligrams of propranolol, and they're doing it every day. Clonopin is like vitamin K for me. I use it every day. And I start, they have 0.25, and it's a ready tab. And it's interesting the effects that that have. And you, you can hear about, well, we're worried about um, a, a dependency and addiction and all that. You won't see it if they stay at 0.25 or 0.5 milligrams. And we give it about an hour and a half before sleep. 
And the nice thing about it is it lasts a long time. And the way it works is it actually works on the vestibular nuclei and it, it works in the cerebellum. And it also is a little bit of an antidepressant too. So those are kind of cool. So just copy this down. I have an important sheet that says I have to rush. So copy these things down. Uh, migraine is treated with SSRIs and SNRIs, and these are all kind of common things. But that's my order. Um, I don't like losing. Uh, you'll see a lot of people go immediately to Prozac or Zoloft. Now, those are more addicting, and I want a psychiatrist or a neurologist to run those things, but it's not unusual for me to use some of those medicines. Um, this is an interesting patient. So a patient had a classic history of Meniere's disease, failed um, diuretic, low salt therapy, had a vestibular nerve section, had the severe unsteadiness post-op, but then never lost oscillopsia, never lost the uh, unsteadiness, and has an inability to work. What are we thinking about with this kind of a patient? Biggest concern is that, I mean, obviously we kind of want a little bit more of the history, what their recurrent vertigo symptoms were, is that they maybe didn't have they any have function no on the right. They have no vertigo, they just are off. Yeah, so I'd be very concerned they have a complete vestibular loss so that their right ear was not normal either. And okay, so what test do you want to get? Well, first of all, what, you're going to examine them, right? What do you expect to see here? They basically have all those things. Yeah. They have post head shake, nystagmus. Something is uncompensated. So they have an uncompensated unilateral vestibular weakness. So even if you have a complete, you know, we expect most patients to get better almost immediately, but which one of these things do you think is going on? Let's assume that the surgery was done correctly. <laughs> um, How are you going to test for that? Because we only stimulate, you know, with calorics, you're only going to stimulate the lateral canal. Yeah. You can use the supine calorics and the prone caloric. So even with ice water prone caloric, it's dead. Right, it's poor compensation. Yeah, so, but sometimes, and you get all these diagnostic tests. So this is what we found on diagnostic tests. So, but what I, one of the things I want you to realize is that you make a diagnosis even without these tests. This was a, from my laboratory. We had rotary chair, posture, but you can tell the patient has an uncompensated unilateral vestibular loss. And the treatment for that is um, going to be physical therapy. This is kind of a cool slide if I can get it to work. This is the head thrust. If you notice, the head thrust, and then it catches back up. Head thrust, catch back up. Head thrust, catch back up. So that's what your head thrust is. You quickly turn it, and the eye has to drift back to center, one eye. It doesn't look like it was the case with this one, but I think it highlights the importance of if you're going to do any sort of a destructive procedure, for them to get better, they have to compensate. Right. And if there's anything that might affect their ability to compensate, that can mean that they're not going to recover. So if they have any other central problems that are maybe affecting that, then that could be a sign that they may not be very good at compensating from a destructive procedure. So I think this is an example where if testing beforehand, pretty comprehensive testing to make sure there's no signs of any central dysfunction before you do something pretty aggressive because you may end up making them in a position where they don't even compensate with physical therapy. So, so I, and that's, you know, you, want, you don't want to do it on a non-athletic person. And we do very, very, I think we did one vestibular neurectomy for all of us last year. So it's not a, something that we use very often. So it's an uncompensated peripheral vestibular weakness. And um, I think Doug's gonna come to get me now, but this is one thing, it could be this too, right? 
So you can have an uncompensated unilateral vestibular loss. But patients come to us now saying, what about this triple PD thing? And it's all over the internet. And so because it's so common, the Barony Society kind of made a list of what to consider when you're looking at triple PD. So do all of you see this in your clinic? Right. Do any of you treat it? Right. right. So this is, what it is, is it's kind of like mal debarkment syndrome. It's a brain dysfunction of compensation that occurs with an acute vestibular injury. So it can happen after a vestibular nerve section, where you have a vestibular nerve section and you go into this maladaptive state where the vestibular ocular reflexes or the vestibular spinal reflexes just aren't working. And the last thing you want to hear is head fog. That's, you know, they feel like they're in a head fog. Yeah, Jeff. Uh, just to add one thing before we end. There's a lot of interesting data coming out now about the relationship of Meniere's disease and migraine. So my, my thought process is always, I always tiptoe around anything ablative for Meniere's patients as we discussed. And if you're ever in a jam and you've done everything, um, always think migraine. And there's data showing that if you take a, a true Meniere's patient and you treat them for migraine, the Meniere's can get better. Um, so well, there's also coexistence, right? That, that new data, like you said, it shows that if you take all patients with Meniere's disease, they have a 60% chance of having migraine. Not migraine-associated dizziness, but migraine. And if you take migraine patients, they're much more common to have Meniere's disease than a regular population. But it also is true for any vestibular insult. If you look at positional vertigo patients, they're more likely to have migraine than people out in the, because anything that causes trauma can be a trigger for migraine, right? So that's, that's why you always have to think about it. The personality type for these persistent postural perception dizziness is also interesting. This is a word, I can't even pronounce it, but Joe Goebel can pronounce it really, catastrophize. They, they're, they're a little personality hyper when they develop this, and then their body can't compensate after an acute injury. So thank you for your time and attention. I have a few more, but Doug's getting closer to the microphone.